Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back and it's great to see you all. Um, we missed you last week, but we trust that you all enjoyed your Thanksgiving week with your family and friends. And in the still lingering spirit of Thanksgiving, we want to express our gratitude for our loyal and engaged audience. Thank you for joining us every Wednesday afternoon. And thank you for your generosity in helping to sustain this unique series. Your response to Giving Tuesday was exemplary, and we are great and we are very grateful. I personally want to express my gratitude for my America at a crossroad colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> they're terrific to work with, and we all work really hard to bring these programs to you, and it's a joy to work with each of them. Tonight, we especially welcome and thank our honored guest, Dr. Richard Haas, who for the past 20 years has led the Council on Foreign Relations, and of course, welcome to Warren Olney, our esteemed moderator. America at a Crossroads is a joint venture between Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. Excuse me. Thanks, as always, to our leadership team, which includes David Lehrer, former Congressman Mel Levine, Zevi Roslovsky, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and Caroline Kelly. Tonight represents the 136th program of America to Crossroads weekly town hall series. Next week, we will welcome Juliet Kayem, former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, who will discuss our homeland security and learning to live in an age of disasters. Ominous. The following week, we host Robin White, Wright, noted scholar and a leading authority on Iran and the Middle East. She will talk to us about the Iranian rebellion and all things Iran. If you are not signed up to be on our uh, email list, you won't get the Zoom link, you won't get announcements. So if you unregister, you un unsubscribe, you need to email me and I'll resubscribe you so you do get the links on a timely basis. We have put the closed captioning information uh, up on the chat here. As long as you enable it on your end, you'll get closed captioning. Um, so we hope that you can figure out how to do that so that you can hear every word our guest has to say tonight. We will put, um, we'll, we already put the note in the chat, I believe. Now, please welcome my colleague and friend, David Lehrer. David. Thank you, Janice. It's great to be back after our Thanksgiving break. For better or worse, the challenges around us continue. Neither the nation nor the world took a week off. In addition to the upcoming programs that Janice just mentioned, I want to note the subsequent two sessions that deal with disturbingly salient issues. On December 21st, we'll host Jim Rutenberg, a writer at large for the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine. He's the author of a revelatory article in the magazine earlier this month in which he links Putin's desire to subjugate the Ukraine with his courting of Trump going back to 2015. It is one of those uh, revealing pieces that compellingly connects the dots. It will be a fascinating discussion. You'll receive a link to his article and an email from us shortly. After New Year's break on January 4th, we will have a journalist who needs no introduction, Times David Brooks. We have welcomed him in the past. He's always insightful and compelling. And now my colleague on the JUDJ board, former Congressman Nell Levine. He's been crucial to the success of these programs, unhesitatingly inviting key leaders and opinion molders whom he knows to join our programs. Mel will introduce I introduce our guest and our moderator. Mel? Thank you very much, David. And um, we very warmly welcome Dr. Richard Haas as our speaker this evening. Uh, Richard um, uh, is in his 20th year as president of the Council on Foreign Relations. I think that's longer than any other CFR president. He previously served in the State Department under Presidents George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan at the White House under George H.W. Bush and the Pentagon during the Carter administration. He was the US envoy to the Cyprus negotiations and the Northern Ireland peace process. And after 9-11 was US coordinator for the future of Afghanistan. I first met Richard in the late 1980s when he was senior director of the National Security Council on Near East and um, South Asian affairs. It crossed my mind when I was thinking of his uh, appearance here this evening that I was probably not the most supportive congressman on some of the issues that Richard was advocating during those years. I do wanna say in hindsight uh, that Richard and his colleagues proved to be one of the best, most effective, capable foreign policy teams that America has ever had. Uh, in addition to his 
formal duties, in his spare time, Richard is the author or editor of 14 books on American foreign policy and one book on management. And his next book, entitled The Bill of Obligations, The 10 Habits of Good Citizens, will be published by Penguin Press next month. Uh, and it will uh, arrive to very, very rave reviews. I hope that Warren will discuss some of these uh, aspects of his book with Richard during the discussion. Uh, Richard is a Rhodes Scholar, holds a bachelor's degree from Oberlin, a doctorate from Oxford, and numerous honorary degrees. He is as well the recipient of the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award, the Presidential Citizens Medal, and the Tipperary International Peace Award. It's very fortunate to us, uh, for us, that he's with us this evening. Once again, our moderator is my good friend, Warren Olney, Warren Olney tongue twister, Warren. Uh, Warren <laughs> is a Los Angeles treasure. He is the host and executive producer of the podcast To The Point and To The Point's climate change update. He's the recipient of nearly 40 annual, 40 national, regional, and local awards for broadcast excellence from Emmys to Golden Mics, including his colleagues awarding him the Lifetime Achievement Award. Warren, uh, it's all yours. Well, Mel, thank you so much. And thank you so much for putting me in such extraordinary company. Uh, Dr. Haas, it is a real privilege for me uh, to be able to talk with you. And thanks so much for giving me uh, the opportunity. I know that uh, uh, we like to think of watching this program, America at a Crossroads, as an exercise in good citizenship. So. Uh, You've come to the right place, I think. Uh, we want to talk about your book, but we'll wait a bit uh, and talk about other things first, if we may. I also want to recognize you in the audience uh, and say, remember that in 40 minutes or so, I will be asking your questions of Dr. Haas. So don't forget, you can text them to David Lehrer and he will text them to me and I will then ask them uh, as time goes on. Um, Dr. Haas, before we get to the book, you have written in the centennial edition, I might say, of Foreign Affairs Magazine, that this is the most dangerous moment since World War II. Uh, in other places, you've said, if you're not worried, you're not paying attention. You've been paying attention for a long time. What are you most worried about? First of all, let me just say, it's good to be with you, Warren. It's good to uh, be back in touch with my old neighbor, Mel Levine. And I appreciated his... Uh, his generous comments. And it's great to have so many people uh, on this uh, Zoom, uh, to have this many people interested in these issues. To me, is a, it's, a, it's a reassuring sign. So thank you all for giving us, uh, giving us an hour. Uh, I'm hard pressed to choose one thing. Uh, so let me just choose. It's really more the combination of three things. Uh, one is the, uh, the revival of geopolitics. Uh, you know, we obviously we're living with it with Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, China's become a far more assertive uh, actor, far more capable. And obviously there's concerns about what it might do, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. You've got North Korea on a regular basis shooting off missiles, expanding its, uh, not just its missiles, but its nuclear inventory. Iran, for good reason, we're focused on the protests. But in the meantime, Iran is inching closer day by day to having in place the prerequisites of a, a nuclear weapon. And meanwhile, it hasn't let up its uh, push for regional primacy. Then at the global level, you've got uh, climate change and whatever else happened in Egypt the last few weeks, it did not constitute progress on the climate uh, issue. We're still suffering some of the consequences of a global pandemic that claimed somewhere between 15 and 20 million uh, lives around the world, a million lives plus or minus here in the United States alone. And then we've got our own domestic challenges in the United States that not only get in the way of effective government, but I think raise fundamental questions, one about our ability to be a uh, consistent, predictable force in the world. Uh, but also I think there's questions that have been raised about our cohesion, the fabric of American society and whether it can necessarily uh, last you know, we've made it to nearly two and a half centuries. Well, one of the uh, one of the concerns I have is I think we've we've learned the hard way that we can't take ourselves and our democracy 
for granted. So indeed, if I had to choose one thing, Warren, I would choose this last thing because our ability to deal with the global challenges, be it China or Russia or climate change or what have you, so much depends upon our having the uh, cohesion, the uh, focus, the bandwidth uh, to deal with these issues. And if we're divided and distracted and literally fighting ourselves here at home, then we're not gonna be in a position to shape the world. And what history shows us is a world uh, that the United States is not playing a significant role in, I think is a world that deteriorates significantly. And we may try to escape our responsibilities, but we will not be able to escape the consequences. When the new Congress uh, assembles in January, uh, it's gonna be as divided or the government is gonna be as divided as it's been within my memory. And I go back a long way as do you. Um, how concerned are you about that? Let's break it down. We are going to be divided. I think it'll be extraordinarily difficult for this president to get legislation through the uh, Congress. I think the House of Representatives will tend to put politics before uh, policy. I think uh, there's a good chance that investigations will take precedence over uh, legislation. Uh, I think that means the president will probably turn more to executive action, which shall we say is uh, an imperfect uh, response to such, uh, such challenges. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, I'm, I'm not as worried, only because if you look at American history, you look at the Constitution, uh, most, of the, most of the initiative when it comes to foreign policy falls to the executive branch, uh, for better and for worse. So I think you know, the president will be, be in a position to carry out most of the foreign policy that he wants. I also don't think in those areas where Congress is most involved, for example, in having to approve uh, funds, I don't expect Republicans, say, to shut off aid to Ukraine. And I think even if some Republicans voted for that, I think you'd still have a majority of Democrats and a majority of Republicans who would support uh, continue, continuing uh, support. So I actually think when it comes to foreign policy, I don't think a divided Congress uh, will... Um, will have quite the effect that it will have on, on domestic issues. To what extent do you think that the Biden administration for the next couple of years is going to have to be continuing to overcome damage that was done by the Trump administration? Well, I think you know, all administrations, you, know, you, get, you get to choose a lot of things when you're president of the United States. You can choose your running mate, you can choose your cabinet, uh, you can choose your policies. The only thing you can't choose is your inbox. So the Biden administration inherited some things from the Trump administration, which for better or worse, they've continued. Uh, they've largely continued policy towards China. Uh, I'm hard pressed to see significant differences. Uh, I'm not happy about it, but they've continued the policy on trade. The Trump administration opposed free trade. The Biden administration largely opposes free trade. I think we, put, we pay an enormous economic and strategic price for the fact that we're not involved in what used to be called the Trans-Pacific uh, partnership. Both administrations, I think, have been were uh, anxious to get out of Afghanistan, I believe, rashly. Both administrations have tried to distance themselves in large part from the Middle East, and we may grow tired of the Middle East. Doesn't mean that uh, that, that, that fatigue is uh, reciprocated. I also think yeah, every administration inherits things from its predecessor, again, that are problematic. Yeah, I, I wasn't a great fan, in many cases, of the Obama foreign policy raise questions about American uh, commitments in the Middle East, the so-called red line debacle in, in Syria, the, the changes on, uh, in Iraq and, uh, and, and Afghanistan. So again, you, know, you can always cherry pick those things you don't like about the, the previous administration. I think, the, I think the biggest difference between the Trump and Biden administration, and I think the Biden administration has got it right, is the centrality of, of uh, working with and through allies that this is a, an alliance first foreign policy in Europe and it's alliance first foreign policy in, in Asia. And in Asia, it's with Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, to some extent, uh, India, and Europe, obviously with uh, NATO. And I think that is uh, the most important difference and the most important corrective of the Biden administration is to resurrect the centrality and strength of America's alliances. Let me ask you about the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, it, it sometimes seems to people, I think, that uh, there's more continuity between administrations than there is separation. And you're suggesting to some extent that that's still true, uh, even though there's such many differences between the 
Trump administration and the Biden administration, um, and of course the Obama administration before. Uh, what role does the council play? Who's on it? What What do you do? And, and to what extent do you try to maintain uh, some kind of continuity and some kind of order uh, in American foreign policy? So let me explain who we are, what we are, and also probably what we're not. We're 101 years old. We were founded uh, early in the previous uh, century, uh, largely founded by businessmen and lawyers uh, in the Northeast. And the whole idea was to fight the wave of uh, isolationism that was overtaking the country, obviously led to the United States not joining the League of uh, Nations. We have evolved considerably since then. We're a membership organization. We have about 5,000 Americans who are members scattered around greater New York, greater Washington, D.C., and the rest of the country. A plurality of our members now comes from uh, outside of Washington or, or, or New York. We're geographically diverse, we're diverse in, in all the other measures of, uh, of diversity. What we are uh, is nonpartisan. We don't have a uh, political leaning. We're independent. We don't take resources from the US or, or other governments. We don't have power. Uh, what we have is uh, you know, the ability to be a resource. So we try to be a resource for the Congress, for the executive branch, for journalists, for corporations, for students, for religious and congregational leaders, uh, pretty much anyone who's uh, interested in American foreign policy. And in many cases, we try to get people interested who aren't interested. A big part of what we do now is you know, we're an educator. We're probably the leading producer of educational materials in this country to teach Americans about the uh, world. We published the leading magazine in the field, Foreign Affairs uh, Magazine. We're a think tank. We probably have 75 full and part-time scholars writing books, uh, articles, whatever. Uh, we meet a lot. We probably have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 events a year in person or on uh, Zoom dealing with uh, all the issues uh, you can uh, think about. So if I had to use a single word to sum up what we are is we're a resource. And we're there to hopefully raise the quality of the conversation in the United States about the world, about America's relationship with the world, but we don't, we don't push particular policies. I have my own pre you know, preferences. Other people is, who write in the magazine or speak at our meetings or write books have their own policy preferences, but there's no council on foreign relations uh, preference. We don't push this or that uh, policy. Again, our view, our role is simply to be a, a, what we like to think is a trusted authoritative resource. Don't you try to be influential? Of course, and the whole idea is to you know, have our what it is we say, what it is we write. Again, in our magazine, in our books, on television, where have you in meetings like this, we uh, individuals who are associated with the council uh, give their analysis. In some cases, give their prescriptions about what ought to happen. And you know, I'd like to think that you know, I'll speak personally for a second that you know, people find some of my analysis uh, thoughtful. Some of it might find some of my recommendations uh, worth, worth uh, supporting. So of course, we try to have influence. My point is simply, we don't have power. All we can do is put forward these ideas, put forward these recommendations, and it's up to those citizens or those who are, you know, like Mel Levine used to be, uh, people who sit in Congress, people in the executive branch. It's up to them to be influenced by, to choose or choose not to be influenced by what it is we, we uh, put forward in the way of analysis or, or policy recommendations. But of course, we, 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 we want to make a difference. But you know, I can't control that. All I can do is make sure that we put forth really thoughtful, fact-based, accurate, policy-relevant work, which hopefully people respect and even if they don't agree with, take seriously. Well, thank you so much for doing saying that because I think you're cited so many times and the council has cited so often uh, that I think people don't necessarily realize what it is that uh, people are talking about when they refer uh, to the council. Let me ask you about some of your own analysis, uh, particularly as reflected in this most recent edition of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, you say that the U.S. has squandered much of its post-war inheritance. What do you mean by that? What what inheritance was there? Was it was it squandered sure. by mistaken actions or failures to act or something of both? Short answer is both. Uh, I'm talking about the post Cold War period, which Cold War came to an end roughly 30 years ago. And if you contrast the creativity 
that followed the end of World War II, you know, the birth of uh, all these international organizations, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations, the forerunner of the World Trade Organization, the NATO Alliance and other uh, alliances and so forth. Uh, the United States, uh, the Truman administration of all, of all was extraordinarily creative. And I am uh, hard pressed to see anything analogous after the end of the Cold War. We ended the Cold War in a position of tremendous advantage. Uh, the Soviet Union, you know, we won the Cold War, first of all. Uh, it ended peacefully and on terms that even an optimist would not have uh, predicted. Soviet Union disintegrated. Many countries that had been part of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union, not only became independent and the entities that had been part of them, but became uh, to, to some extent or considerable extent democratic. Uh, the United States uh, had had good relations with China during the uh, last several decades of the Cold War. So we had tremendous opportunities and I, you know, I don't see that we have much to show for it. I don't see, you asked about acts of omission and acts of commission. Well, I think we made tremendous mistakes in places like Iraq and then in getting ambitious in Afghanistan. Uh, a policy that tried to transform societies that were not ripe for transformation, I think history will be uh, properly critical of. And I don't see that we did a lot of uh, institution building, or in some cases, crazily enough, where we built, designed the institutions, I mentioned it before, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we then wouldn't join. Uh, so just a major own goal, to use a, a World Cup metaphor, uh, that the United States in that case thing, we, 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 we didn't do. I also think we were right to allow China into the World Trade Organization some two decades ago, but then we didn't monitor it. And China in many ways cherry picked its relationship with the United States in the world and grew, but, not, uh, but did not grow in a reform sort of way. So I think, you know, again, historians will look at where we stood 30 years ago, where we stand today. And I think they will shake their heads about how little we have to show for the advantages we emerged uh, from the Cold War uh, possessing. You mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan. In both cases, there was talk about uh, spreading democracy and how the United States had to spread a democracy. Is that a mistaken idea? Well, I think the idea of, of hoping to spread democracy per se is not a mistaken idea. I believe that democracy is by far uh, the most valued form of government and society. I think it. Uh, does the most to unleash human opportunity and potential. I think it goes hand in hand with the market economy, which has proven itself over history to be the most predict productive. But to try to transform other societies, uh, often uh, against the backdrop of military presence, when these societies didn't seem, seem to have many of the social or cultural or educational or economic prerequisites of democracy, uh, I would argue is simply uh, misguided. And I think we, we paid an enormous price for our ambitions and how we went about uh, implementing them. I mean, let I me mean, think about it, Warren. If 30 years ago, you would say, you would have predicted that the United States would spend the preponderance of its resources focusing on the greater Middle East, rather than Europe and rather than uh, Asia, rather than Latin America, or Africa, but on the greater Middle East and trying to bring democracy to the Middle East, uh, people would have said, no way that's going to dominate American foreign policy. Well, that's exactly what dominated American foreign policy. And, you know, I've written a previous book about wars of choice and, you know, the war of choice that was Iraq in 2003, the very different from the Gulf War uh, of 1990, 1991, the war of choice that Afghanistan became, not originated as after we reacted to 9-11, but became when we got ambitious there. Again, I think these were truly uh, unfortunate uh, foreign policy, well, foreign policies. And I think we, we paid an enormous price in blood and treasure. I also think it weakened our standing in the world. I also think it alienated a lot of Americans from foreign policy. It created some of the uh, doubts about the uh, government and establishment that many Americans had saying, why should we listen to you all? Look at what you've done. Uh, look at the policy decisions you've made. So I think, yes, history will judge these uh, quite harshly. Critics often say that, uh, in fact, uh, we are spending so much on defense, many more times than the combined uh, spending of uh, other potential enemies. 
uh, that we're wasting an enormous amount of money, that what we really want to do is uh, dominate the world, that it's all about imperialism and, um, and, and making money. To what extent is that a, a, an accurate critique of the way things work in this country? About to zero extent. It's a really <laughs> deeply, deeply flawed uh, critique on every level. First of all, what we're spending on foreign policy is a percentage of our economy, of our GDP, our gross domestic product, is roughly half the level we averaged during the Cold War. So I'm not going to sit here and say we're not spending a lot on defense. Of course we are. But we're spending in the, in the ballpark of 3.5%, plus or minus, on it. Again, that, you know, during the Cold War, we spent 6 7% off and more. So in the last I checked during the Cold War years, we not only succeeded in the world, we, we made tremendous strides at home. So the idea that what we're doing abroad inevitably costs us at home is just wrong. And just as an aside, it's not what, how much you spend on policies at home, it's how you spend them. We spend enormous amounts on entitlements. We spend enormous amounts uh, on other things like education. We, uh, we don't necessarily have a lot to show for those things. So I think uh, this idea that what we do in the world somehow comes at the expense of what we should do at home is just a deeply flawed idea. And there's any number of examples, again, how disorder in the world will exacerbate our challenges here at home. We cannot safely turn our, our, our backs uh, on the world. Also, the idea that we run around the world doing what we're doing for narrow commercial or economic gain is simply not true. Look at the wars, you know, whether it's the Gulf War or the war I just criticized in Iraq, American companies didn't cash in. Yes, we were concerned about the st you know, strategic access to oil, but we didn't go to, to war for this or that energy company. That wasn't the, the purpose. So the, that critique often from the left, I just find uh, deeply at variance with, um, with, uh, with the facts and, uh, and, and, and with reality. Look, look, I'm not going to say that everything we spend on foreign policy is well spent. Of course not. Well, we make, I, I've just talked about several er errors we've made. Some of the weapon systems uh, aren't, uh, you know, are, are questionable and, and, and so forth. So again, we're, there's, there's built in errors. But as a, as a general proposition, I think we need to spend a lot on defense. Indeed, at the risk of alienating everyone I haven't already alienated, I think we need to spend more. We're at a moment where the United States faces extraordinary challenges in three geographies at once. In Europe, we've got a, a war with Russia, in, in Asia because of uh, China and North Korea, and in the greater Middle East, in large part because of Iran and any number of other uh, groups. So we face three sets of challenges in three parts of the world. We also face other issues from, you know, related to global phenomena, like disease, like uh, climate. So I would actually argue this is a moment we need to spend more, not less, on national security. Some will be in the form of defense systems, some in terms of foreign aid, some in uh, terms of uh, diplomacy and intelligence. But across the board, I would say we need to spend considerably more than we are now spending. What about climate change? You mentioned that before. You mentioned the failures of COP27, uh, much uh, uh, written about that. Uh, is there any possibility, do you think, that there could be a new kind of world order if the major companies of the world, the major emitters, uh, could get together and uh, recognize the dangers of climate change and, uh, uh, and, and work together to do something about it? Or do we have to work independently? Well, the answer is they're not going to get together and do it. Countries are always going to put, well, gov most governments will put their own narrow economic interests first. And most people in political office whether it's democratic or authoritarians, feel they don't have the luxury of worrying about the long term. They've got to get through the short and medium term. So I hold out precious little hope that COP 28, 29, 30, you name it, will do any better than COPs 1 through 27. I just don't think diplomacy is going to deliver. It's not for the lack of good ideas. You simply can't get uh, countries to sign up uh, and abide by them. No, if I hold out any hope, and here's the parallel I draw with you is, uh, from, COP, is from COVID, COVID-19. It's from technology. We got through COVID as well as we did uh, because of two technologies. One is the one we're all benefiting from here, Zoom. Imagine how different it would have been if we didn't have Zoom and we would have faced the idea of our lives and our, the economy grinding to a halt 
or risking infection because we went into crowded spaces. So one thing was Zoom and the other technology that got us through COVID was obviously the mRNA vaccines. And China is a perfect example of what happens when you reject mRNA vaccines and they're paying an enormous price for it. So, but we, we benefited from both. I think if there's any hope of managing climate change, I, um, and this is ironic for me to say, given my background as a diplomat, I don't see it coming from diplomacy. I see it coming from technology. And I would think it will come from breakthroughs with batteries, with uh, fuels, uh, fuel shifting, with renewables, uh, with nuclear, hopefully greater adoption of uh, nuclear power. It may come to the point where we have you know, major breakthroughs with a carbon capture, removing car carbon from the atmosphere, finding places to uh, put it underground and so forth, and possibly even putting particles that reflect sunlight, putting those particles in the atmosphere to cool the earth. I think we're much more likely over the next 40 or 50 years, choose whatever time period, to make progress against climate because of technological gains uh, rather than because of diplomatic agreement. A lot of very, very controversial issues that you mentioned. I'm not gonna ask you to go into any of them in, in uh, detail, but just to make the point that uh, nuclear power putting uh, particles in the atmosphere, all of that uh, has a lot of uh, scientific debate uh, going on about it. Let me ask you about another kind of worst case scenario and that's uh, nuclear warfare. We're ruling out direct military involvement in Ukraine, partly because of the fear of nuclear warfare. Do we have any choice about that? Choice about what exactly, I'm sorry. Could we intervene directly? And, oh, of course, and, uh, the answer is it was, a, it was an option from the get-go. And the administration, I believe wisely, chose not to, that they basically said that we could defend, help Ukraine defend its and maintain its sovereignty, its viability through indirect support. Uh, and by doing that, we wouldn't risk a direct clash with Russia. I mean, it goes back, if you will, to the Cold War, where the Cold War stayed cold in, in large part because the United States and the Soviet Union uh, had certain rules of the road, often uh, implicit, that the two followed. And one of them, though, was obviously to avoid direct clashes for fear that those would lead to escalation. So uh, the administration early on decided that we would not get involved directly, whether it was troops on the ground or with a no-fly zone, uh, and, but instead that we could do what enough to help Ukraine, again, uh, beat back uh, Russian aggression. And I think it's worked extraordinarily well. And I think it has a lot to do with, you know, more than anything with Ukraine with the effectiveness and courage of its, uh, of its uh, military, a remarkable turnaround since 2014. It's a, it's a really great story. I think the Europeans deserve a lot of support, the Poles and others, uh, particularly the Brits. Uh, and also um, you know, the United States. You know, we have been, if you will, the arsenal for, of democracy. We have been the, uh, taking the lead within um, NATO. So, and, Look, if Mr. Putin, if you look at where he was nine, 10 months ago when he started this war in February, he made all sorts of assumptions about the lack of resolve and capability of Ukraine, of NATO, uh, of Europe, and the United States. And he was wrong on all three. Every one of his assumptions proved wrong. A fourth assumption about the relative capability of his own army also proved wrong. So no, I think we've, we've done extraordinarily well yet putting a certain ceiling on the direct costs and the risks. So I think the administration deserves uh, you know, high marks for how it's managed this crisis. Ronald Reagan, I think, was the last president that uh, really tried to cause a reduction in nuclear weapons with the idea that uh, a nuclear war can never be won and consequently uh, should never be fought. Uh, have other presidents failed in that regard? And if so, why? I think there's been some reduction. You know, if you look at New Start and so forth, uh, there's some progress to, you know, to, to, to point to. I think the biggest problem now is with Russia is that because their conventional forces are so weak that Russia's claim to being a great power increasingly stems from its nuclear capabilities. Uh, so the fact that Russia shows precious little interest in or enthusiasm for nuclear arms control talks 
uh, sends you a signal that they increasingly feel a, a need to depend on them. So I would not put the onus on us there. And I think a related problem will be China. China looks at this war, it gets to a question you asked a minute ago, Warren, they say, gee, the United States didn't intervene directly. From the Chinese point of view, one principal reason for that is Russian nuclear capabilities. So China right now has embarked on a massive uh, buildup of its nuclear forces, shows no interest in participation in arms control agreements, but is hoping that if it can create enough of a nuclear arsenal, it might get the United States to think twice about direct military intervention on behalf of Taiwan in any scenario uh, there. So I don't think the problem right now is particularly with uh, American lack of enthusiasm for, for nuclear arms control. We just don't have uh, any partners. Let me uh, turn to questions from our audience. As I said, uh, I, I promised that I would read some of those and then I wanna get to uh, give you an opportunity to talk about the book, which I promised to you uh, at the uh, at the beginning. Um, James wants to know, what are your thoughts on the new Israeli government and the what he refers to as the prospects for progress? Well, I assume when he means progress, well, I will say assume there's two possibilities or three possibilities. I think uh, too soon to know about the new Israeli government. I have any number of concerns given its composition, but I'll uh, uncharacteristically keep an open mind here. Uh, in terms of prog prospects for progress with Palestinians, I think almost none. Uh, there's no disposition in this Israeli government. There's much more of a disposition to build new and expand existing settlements. And there's no Palestinian partner. There's no interlocutor. So you can have uh, all the peace plans you want, but you don't have the prerequisites of a successful negotiation. Instead, you've got division on the Palestinian side. You have, again, so I don't see, I don't see either side as leaning into uh, negotiations to put it generously. I think there's more possibility on uh, Israeli Arabs. And I think the real question is whether the Saudis at some point would normalize with Israel. I think it's a question of when, not if that uh, happens. I don't have a, a timetable, but I think there's a certain degree, uh, inevitability is too strong, but I think likelihood that at some point uh, that happens. Uh, what, what could you know, derail it more than anything might be uh, a new intifada or new real, a new breakdown of relations with Israelis and Palestinians if that were to happen. But I think even if that were to happen, it more delays it than anything uh, else. I think the big issue in, in, for this Israeli government and be one, by the way, with this Israeli government will resemble the previous Israeli government uh, will be Iran. I think there's precious little uh, tolerance in, in Israel for an Iran that gets much closer to nuclear uh, a nuclear weapon and to putting into place the uh, level, uh, the amount of uh, enriched uranium and so forth that you would need. So again, uh, my own view is if I were in the predictions game, which sometimes I, I guess I am, uh, the crisis that worries me most in 2023 is not so much Ukraine. I think a lot of what we see now, we're gonna see then is not Taiwan, but it's gonna be something involving Iran. I think that at the moment, that might be the single most uh, volatile part of the world. Uh, Stan wants to know, what can the world do to counter the threat from Iran? Well, again, um, I don't see a whole lot. We can you know, lend support to this protest. We can uh, hopefully give them some uh, access, greater access to the internet and so forth. But at the end of the day, almost like as was the case in Iran in the late seventies, uh, what will depend, uh, what will determine the fate will be the willingness of the security forces to kill their own people. And in 1977, 78 and 79, what we saw was the security forces increasingly were not prepared to kill their fellow Iranians to maintain the Shah's regime. We'll see what will happen. Uh, you know, these, these, these individuals in Iran uh, are remarkably courageous. The women taking off the hijabs, the men out there, prominent Iranian athletes and uh, persona in the social and the media world, um, making statements of one sort or another hard not to have enormous respect uh, for them. But so we'll see what happens. Uh, so I, think, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot the United States can, can, can do there. In terms of the nuclear program, uh, 
there's zero chance that negotiations will solve it. I think there's zero chance the United States will go back into the 2015 agreement, given the protests in Iran and given the fact that Iran now has chosen to be one of the principal military suppliers of Russia. So I think then you end up with uh, Israel, possibly Saudi Arabia or others, the United States, increasingly looking to covert or military action uh, uh, to slow down the Iranian program. Sanctions can impose a penalty on Iran economically, but sanctions can't stop the progress in the nuclear program. So I would hope that we would communicate to Iran what, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, what our red lines are. And if Iran decides it wants to cross the red lines, then I would think we're, we're likely to see either covert or overt action on the part of Israel, the United States, uh, or both. You mentioned Taiwan. Uh, Pecos wants to know, is Taiwan at risk from Chinese threats? I think you suggested it's not, but uh, perhaps you can explain. No, I think it very much is. It's a question, again, of timetable. You know, this uh, Chinese leadership, uh, Xi Jinping, has made, you know, hasn't been, shall we say, shy about declaring its determination to gain control over Taiwan. It speaks about national rejuvenation all the time. Uh, they haven't ruled out the use of uh, coercion, of force. So what we need, our challenge is to persuade them that if they were to try to uh, use force one way or another from blockades to amphibious uh, invasions, that the cost to them would far outweigh any potential benefits. And that means preparing militarily to do certain things, not just us, but Taiwan, Japan in particular. And it means putting into play sanctions. So China understands that if it were to act, uh, again, the not only would face enormous military obstacles, but it would face enormous economic costs. So again, I know what Chinese preferences are. Well, you know, the role of foreign policy is to shape the foreign policy choices of other countries. So that's our challenge here. Can we shape the foreign policy choices? We can't persuade China. We can't get them to change their goals about Taiwan. What we can do is persuade them to hold off acting in a coercive fan fashion to realize those goals. That ought to be the, the aim of American foreign policy. Talking about shaping other countries' foreign policies, Greg wants to know, what can we do to deter North Korea from pursuing more nuclear weapons? I don't see a whole lot. Uh, I remember years ago when I worked at the uh, Pentagon, Harold Brown, the Secretary of Defense, was once asked about the U.S.-Soviet arms race, and he said, uh, we got a problem. When we build nuclear weapons and missiles, they, they build as well. And when we don't build nuclear weapons and missiles, they still build. And I, I feel that a little bit with North Korea. No matter what we try, whether we try uh, inducements like the previous, you know, the love letters of the previous regime, I mean, the previous administration here, those didn't get us very far. We've tried various arms control approaches. We've tried sanctions. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, North Korea continues to advance its, its nuclear and missile capabilities. It doesn't build down its uh, conventional military capabilities. A lot of this is about China. If the, China is the only external actor that has significant potential, I emphasize the word potential influence over North Korea, China has uh, largely opted not to exercise it. Uh, my own view is China prefers the status quo on the peninsula having two Koreas because uh, it, it fears a unified Korea might fall into the American strategic orbit. So China will, uh, will not use its potential uh, influence or leverage and so forth over North Korea for fears it would destabilize it. So it's prepared, however, uncomfortably to live with North Korea's uh, expansion of uh, missile and nuclear capabilities. I think it's unbelievably short-sighted on China's part. If you look at the debates, a majority of South Koreans in polls now say they favor an independent nuclear force of their own. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time before Japan has a similar conversation. So you know, the history is moving in that part of the world, and I think potentially worrisome uh, ways. But no, I don't see much we can do. I would, I'd be open to having a negotiation with North Korea. From what I understand, this administration has knocked on the door and nobody's answered. Back to uh, Europe, Sid wants to know, how does the Russia-Ukraine war end? Uh, well, the first thing I'd say to Sid is uh, the most likely scenario is it doesn't end anytime soon. That the most likely 
scenarios, the war goes on and then on and on. And the, the reason for that is for the war to end, both sides would have to be willing to compromise. And I don't at the moment detect a, uh, a, a willingness of either side to compromise. Ukraine talks about war aims of gaining every uh, inch of its territory going back to 1991 when it became independent. So that includes Crimea, includes what they lost in 2014. They want uh, rep economic reparations. They want accountability for war crimes. Russia, for its part, under Mr. Putin, clearly has, uh, you know, has, has wanted to extinguish Ukraine as an independent entity. And it's not clear to me he would even come close to meeting Ukrainian goals because it would look like a defeat. And Mr. Putin obviously fears a defeat in Ukraine would lead to uh, potentially his losing power at home. So my own view is both sides would rather continue a war seeking their, uh, their, their, their ambitions rather than have to defend uh, compromise. And I think you know, it's quite possible the war will continue, as I said, but at a slightly lower level of intensity. I'm not sure either side's in a position to sustain the kind of intense fighting We've seen uh, simply won't have the munitions and the like that they uh, have had over the past eight or nine uh, months. You know, what would it take for changes? One or the other side would have to uh, essentially sue for peace. Uh, it may not come until there's an alternative leadership in Russia that's willing to make significant uh, compromise. What How Mr. Putin is, is clearly it? hoping. Let me say, finish one thought. Mr. Putin's clearly hoping that even though he, while he can't win on militarily on the battlefield, he can weaken the will of Ukraine by these attacks on its civilian infrastructure, mm. economic infrastructure. He's hoping that maybe European or American support will fall away. And what he is hoping is that ultimately Ukraine will be forced to come to the table in a weakened position. That is his strategy. I don't see that uh, uh, happening. So I would, I would think this goes on and I don't see, uh, any significant domestic challenge to Mr. Putin. If there's any challenge at all, it's from the right, not from the left. Uh, so, you know, sorry to be the purveyor of, a, of grim news here, but it's quite possible that this, this becomes part of the, of the this, you know, part of the backdrop to all else, this fighting. The degree of, horror that is taking place in Ukraine is like nothing that uh, most people I think have ever seen before, certainly nothing they've ever wanted to see. You think we're going to have to endure that and that the Ukrainians are going to have to endure that? Are they going to be able to endure that uh, uh, for the indefinite future? Well, you're asking, are they going to have to? I don't see how we stop it. You know, Mr. Putin controls the narrative in this country. And as I said, I don't think he's going to suddenly sue for peace and become a, uh, you know, mm. full, a man defined by compromise. I do think there's a decent chance, though, that the intensity of the war will somewhat diminish. But I you know, could be wrong there. And what you may see is, is the intensity of the battlefield war will diminish. But Mr. Putin, the intensity of his, of his attacks on civilian and economic infrastructure may not. That's increasingly what his strategy uh, uh, is. So I, I think this uh, goes on. Can Ukraine survive? Yeah, I think history suggests that societies that are attacked in this kind of indiscriminate way, uh, I think, you know, if you look at, say, bombing during World War II against Britain, it's an imperfect parallel. But I think you know, rather than breaking the back of the British people, it tended to uh, motivate them, create a tremendous sense of national uh, determination and resilience. Also, though, Ukraine's going to need our help and European help uh, to, to fix what is broken, to provide economic help, to take in refugees, and so on. This is, this is stunningly costly. And by the way, whenever this war does end, hopefully sooner rather than later, the, the cost of rebuilding will be astronomically uh, hi, uh, you know, Ukraine's probably more than a quarter of its population is displaced. Uh, some inside the country, many, uh, many millions refugees. So this is, this is, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine over the years. This, indeed, when I was there a few months ago, before this latest round of bombing started, 
And you could close your eyes and feel you were in Vienna. You had all the trappings, all the feel of a modern European capital. People in restaurants, people were walking the streets, the barriers were down, uh, people were sipping coffee uh, in sidewalk cafes. And now you see what's 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 happening and uh, the destruction, the costs are hard to imagine. I mean, this is this is more in a you know, uh, this is more in a modern society. This would be as if there were a modern war here in the United States. I think you know a lot of Americans when they've looked at war recently, they saw it as somewhat different because it was in parts of the world like the Middle East that they looked at looked different from here. But Ukraine very much looks very similar in terms of the modern physical plant. And this, this is a, this is going to this is extraordinarily costly, mm -hmm. and the the hardships are unimaginable. But yes, I do think Ukraine will uh, endure. Uh, before I let you talk to, about the book or ask you about the book, and I think you might have some things to say that uh, will be interesting to all of the citizens who are watching the show. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, we're on Zoom, and uh, we are, and we have to be conscious of all of that. And uh, Brenda wants to know, what's that artwork on the wall behind you? <laughs> ah, uh, the piece just behind me is a, a piece by an American living in London named Norma Miller, and it's a multiple uh, paintings uh, of a my well, I thought the greatest figure of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. Oh. And next to uh, that are two paintings I think you can see by uh, an outsider artist, uh, an artist who didn't have formal training, named Nicole Storm, based I believe in California uh so two of her paintings so uh can't just have books every once in a while even even foreign policy types need a little <laughs> bit of art in their lives well thank you for having an interesting uh, hanging on the wall uh, behind you for this conversation let's talk about uh, the bill of obligations the 10 habits of a good a citizen i've read a number of very favorable comments about the book uh, but i have yet to see a list of the 10 habits we're going to have to buy the book to find out. Well, the book doesn't come out till January 24th. So I, if, if I spill all the beans now, your incentive <laughs> to buy it or read it will be uh, much diminished. I, uh, but you know, look, the basic argument of this book, take a step back. The, the, what motivated the book, it comes back to your first question, is what concerns me most is us. You know, I, I spend a lot of time worrying about China and Russia and climate change and the rest. But I've always felt if we were operating as a society with a degree of a commonality, a purpose, a degree of goodwill, as we have for most of the last 75 years, we could accomplish great things, both domestically and internationally. Don't always agree, but we could accomplish great things. And what increasingly concerns me is that's no longer the case. And January 6th was, a, or to me, a real shock. I mean, there a lot of things I worried about. I never imagined I would see something like that. And you know, I spent years as the U.S. envoy to Northern Ireland. I can't rule out that some version of the Troubles, some type of uh, ongoing low-level politically motivated warfare could take place in the United States. I wish that sounded unimaginable, but it doesn't sound unimaginable, uh, I'm a, I, I would uh, say. So what I began to do then was think about what was wrong with American democracy and how do we address it? And, and we all know people who spend their lives putting forward perfectly good ideas about fixing this with the, how, how, you, how you draw congressional districts and stop gerrymandering. This is about the filibuster. This, some people want to do this with a number of justices on the court, what have you. There's a million good ideas or sure. not so good ideas out there. My point is simply, we don't have the political context to agree on them. So what I want to do is change the way Americans think about their democracy, not just focus on rights, not that rights aren't important, but rights aren't enough. Rights are always going to come into conflict, whether it's the rights of the unborn versus the rights of the mother or the rights of public safety versus the rights of gun ownership. We need a mechanism for mediating differences over rights. And we need to have serious debate. And so I have idea, So my obligations deal with things about civility and compromise, nonviolence, about getting informed and understanding what it means to be informed. Uh, I make a strong case for putting country first and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is affect the way, the attitudes, the behavior of Americans that they bring to politics. I do not discuss policy in this book. I assume we're all going to have our policy preferences and differences. What on my view is, okay, how do we still make our democracy work given these differences? 
And how, how do we avoid its breakdown? Because if it does fail to work, if it does break down, the cost to ourselves and the world, I think would be incalculable. So I try to remind people in the book why democracy matters, why it's valuable. But I talk a lot about why we need to give uh, equal weight to obligations, obligations to one another, obligations to our government. We need to give that equal weight uh, as we do to rights. And that's the only way, the only with this kind of a rebalancing will American democracy recover. What are these obligations? Where do they come from? It's just my assessment when I looked at American political behavior of uh, I, I thought long and hard about what would be the most basic things. And, and I, you know, I looked at everything from the Constitution to the Federalist Papers, to the great literature, to the great history. I read uh, every inaugural speech. I read all the farewell addresses. I read more Supreme Court decisions than many <laughs> lawyers, I expect. Uh, and it was my attempt to just think about what, were, what, what would be necessary. I looked at times we've made progress and what seemed to be behind the ability to, to make progress. So that's where they came from. It was, uh, you know, there's no, you know, you, 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 know, you got your 10 rights in the Bill of Rights, you got your 10 commandments. So I decided to come up with 10 obligations that I derive from what I thought was uh, both the best and the worst of the American political experience over the last two and a half centuries. Well, I've given up any effort to uh, try to get you to tell us what the obligations are. And of course, I look forward to, uh, uh, to seeing the book. But what, what's the, um, what are the foreign implications, foreign affairs implications, and the, and the implications for America's role in the world uh, when uh, citizens aren't living up their obligations in the United States? What does it That's mean? Great... And, and uh, what, 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 put those two things together. Well, I, I did give you quite a few of the obligations. I just snuck them in there. And uh, you know, the most <laughs> important, I think, is to be informed and then to be involved. I think those are two pretty important obligations. I mean, the fact that in the recent midterm elections, still, what, more than half of Americans who could have voted didn't shows to me we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a problem there. The foreign policy implications are many. One is, uh, if we are at war with ourselves, we're not going to be in a position to shape things around the world. We're simply not gonna have the attention or uh, bandwidth to the resources to do it. Uh, if we're not coming together, we're not gonna meet our many domestic challenges. So that'll weaken our competitive position or weaken our economic uh, base. We're certainly not gonna be, if we're not united in certain ways, allies won't be able to depend on us. Uh, allies were really shaken by things like January 6th. You know, countries like South Korea, you know, polls show, as I mentioned before, a majority wants to have a nuclear weapons. The problem is not just North Korea, it's a lack of confidence in us. Can we really be counted on? The sharp swings from the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration have unnerved people. They were used to changes between administrations, say between the 40 yard lines, but not from the end zones. This is uh, unnerving to a lot of the world. I think it also encourages foes. I think Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine in part because he thought he could discount the United States. He thought that we would not be willing or able to uh, stand up. I'd also say if democracy here doesn't work, why would other people around the world want to be democratic? Why would they want to emulate what doesn't look to be a successful system? We've got a really interesting go thing going on right now. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it in Russia, in China, in Iran, we're seeing the many obvious failures of authoritarian systems, often their inability to make good decisions or when they make mistakes, their inability to correct the mistakes lest they look uh, weak or what have you. Uh, but that's not enough. We've also got to show the success and advantages of, of, of a democratic system. Again, you know, where we get things right, we hopefully make better decisions. And again, we're better able to correct bad decisions if, if need be. And, then, and that's how you win the competition for ideas and that's how you shape the world by example. And you know, we'll see if uh, we can do that. I think we've got an amazing opportunity in part because of the failures of the authoritarians, but we've got to step up and grab that opportunity. So Richard Haas, it has been uh, wonderful to talk uh, with you. We could go on for hours, I am sure. And uh, I personally want to thank you again for doing it. I'm sure our audience 
uh, feels the same way after uh, you've been 20 years the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. You've got a lot more to say, and I hope you'll continue to say it. And once again, the book is the Bill of Obligations, the Ten Habits of a Good Citizen. You haven't heard all about them, uh, all about all of them here uh, on this uh, program, uh, despite my efforts and uh, and your very kind uh, and generous uh, statements about it. So uh, I would urge people to uh, look at the book. Thank you very much again for being with us, Dr. Richard Haas. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, next Wednesday on December 7th, interesting uh, date, uh, Juliet Kayam will be here. She's a former Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security. He's author, author of The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Uh, the, taking off to some extent from what we've been talking about today, I guess I'll be talking with her once again. That's on Wednesday, December 7th. In the meantime, thanks to all of you for watching. Stay in good health, be safe, and uh, keep your mask on.